Uh, good morning. It, this is the Senate Natural Resources and Energy Committee. It's Wednesday, February 2nd. This is the second half of our morning session. And this morning we are uh, doing some uh, bill introductions on S-129, an act relating to the management of fish and wildlife, S-201, an act relating to the use of leg hold traps, and S-281, an act relating to hunting uh, coyotes with dogs. So um, these are all uh, full-fledged bills, and it's, these are all much bigger topics. We're going to be taking regular committee testimony later this session. We're also going to be having a public hearing. That public hearing will be 5.30 to 7.30 p.m. Um, on a week from tomorrow. So it'll be the 10th of February. We'll be putting out a notice shortly. It, people will be able to, everyone, it will be entirely virtual. So it'll be a, a Zoom meeting. Um, people will be given a chance to speak. Uh, it will probably be brief, depending on how many people are signing up. Uh, and you'll, be, you'll need to pre-register in order to be on that link. And um, if you've ever been to one of those bigger hearings uh, before, you, you know that we work hard to make them fair, balanced, and civil, uh, because sometimes tensions can come up around different points of view. Uh, hunting and fishing, wildlife uh, can be a passionate issue, pro and con for lots of people. So with that, I'm, we'll, I'm asking everyone to do their best to uh, uh, help us get the bills introduced. And to that, to the notion of having this be uh, a balanced start, I think we have, we're going to hear from uh, four speakers on each of these bills. We're asking people to speak for just five to six minutes, not a long time, but enough to certainly give the committee a sense of the range of views out there. And then again, we will be taking ample additional testimony on each of the bills when we work, but this is a, 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 gonna be sort of a, an enhanced introduction to the topics. And we'll hear again, people supporting and questioning the bills. So with that, um, I'm gonna ask everyone to try to aim for roughly five minutes. Again, you can get a lot, a lot shared in five minutes. And also please know that you'll be invited back to speak at a greater length later. So that, um, Mr. Kelly, you are first up on S-129. Good morning. Thank you very much, Senator Bray. Um, I'm grateful. I'm the vice chair of the Vermont Wildlife Coalition. And on behalf of all of our members, I'm just grateful uh, to this, to this committee for bringing these issues to the table here in Vermont's highest public forum. Uh, when I was a student at Otter Valley Union High School in Brandon, we used to bring our deer rifles to school. In fact, on Friday, some students would leave their deer rifles in their locker so they could go straight to deer camp. But times change. Our governance of fish and wildlife in Vermont is still stuck in those days when we used to bring our deer rifles to school. Despite a statutory mandate to preserve and protect the public trust, we have a Fish and Wildlife Board today that sanctions killing as many Eastern coyotes as possible and piling them up like cordwood. Morning, noon, night, 365 days a year. That dismisses a proposal out of hand to disallow hunting with high-tech smartphones connected to live action trail cams with virtually no discussion. Likewise, dismissing a petition to shorten the trapping season for otters to protect young river otters. Imagine that Vermont is a family and that the family is given a precious trust of fish and wildlife. There is no requirement that any of those we entrust with this priceless birthright have any experience, expertise, or professionalism. I want to ap applaud the recent appointment of David Dean to the board. I suspect do in no little part to the heightened scrutiny now being given to these issues. But even the way we select members to this board is a mystery. No one knows how the members are actually chosen. No one knows what experience or background is required. No one knows what the selection process actually involves. Qualified people apply and they do not get so much as an acknowledgement of their application. When there should be high standards for managing this trust, there are no standards. The evidence that Vermonters are moving beyond a dominance mindset 
towards wildlife is overwhelming. The governance process we have in place for that wildlife should not be standing in the doorway and should not be blocking the hall. That's essentially what I want to say about this bill, but I would like to add a short word about another one. I have hunted birds using dogs. I have hunted rabbits using dogs. In fact, I have hunted and fished with some of the most outstanding outdoorsmen in the history of the state of Vermont, including wildlife writer Harold Blaisdell and the former commissioner of Fish and Wildlife, Steve Wright. The teamwork and the training of an English setter or a Brittany holding their point hunting is an example, I think, of the very finest aspects of the relationship between human beings and dogs. Hounding coyotes epitomizes an entirely different side relationship. Chasing down Eastern coyotes and corner, cornering them with packs of hounds is reminiscent of the behavior of people like Michael Vick. It is certainly not the behavior of the former commissioner of Fish and Wildlife, Steve Wright, and the other outstanding outdoorsmen uh, here in the state of Vermont. It's time to stop that behavior. Thank you. That's all I have to say. Uh, thank you, Mr. Kelly. And now I'll go to um, Commissioner Herrick. Good morning, Commissioner Herrick. Good morning, Mr. Chair, and thank you for your time. Okay. Um, so the department um, is concerned uh, about this bill for a number of reasons. And I think everyone would agree um, that anyone who has interest is interested in a goal of fair, transparent management of fish and game and fur bearers for all Vermonters. That's based in science. And I do know this is a goal we all share. Here are some of the elements though that we're concerned about. Dividing, dividing the responsibility for appointing board members between the governor, the legislature, on a committee is unnecessary and adds more bureaucracy. Um, and it, it just, it, it doesn't seem to align with the role of the executive branch um, in enforcing the laws passed by the legislature. The bill also proposes geographic diversity, but reduces the number from 14 to 12. The current structure has representatives from each county. And so, so it seems to be an internal conflict with the bill with its own stated goals and our shared goals as well of having a diverse geographic representation. I wonder which two counties would be selected to not have representation. Um, let me just move on. I know we're short on time. Um, the board fills an important function by balancing the commissioner in its current function. Removing that power removes a level of assurance that fish, game, and fur bearer management be held to the lens of science, potentially, and our mission by if you have a change in administration, the commissioner's office could change just as frequently and allow for a bit of a roller coaster in policy development and management. Whereas the board uh, with its um, overlapping six year terms deliberately slows the process and, and insulates it from that kind of uh, up and down and topsy turvy management. The other thing is the implied message of this bill is that the citizens in the hunting, fishing and trapping community are not qualified and are not the right people to vet the department's proposed regulations around hunting, fishing and trapping. Additionally, this means that there's a belief that the board is somehow not currently relying on the recommendations of the biologists and the other professionals who work at the department. I am not aware of any decision by the board that did not follow the scientific recommendations. To the contrary, the board has backed uh, the recommendations of the scientists on the decisions that have been unpopular with many consumptive users 
but are clearly supported by science and our mission. For example, reducing moose hunting opportunities from their peak while research on climate change and moose numbers was being conducted. We have a legitimate concern about the appointment of people who have no knowledge of hunting and fishing and trapping and making recommendations about rules related to hunting and fishing and trapping, which is the entire focus of the board uh, authority, both now and with this bill. I would like to reiterate, the impl impl implication is if we put different people on the board, then we're going to get different decisions. So does that mean these different people would disregard the science that is recommended by the biologists and scientists here at the department? The current governance system relies on expertise of these professionals who have dedicated their careers to the mission of fish and wildlife. And the system has already shown its value for game and non-game species alike. Endangered species uh, permitting and recovery, uh, for example, we just delisted the bald eagle. Reversal of deer overpopulation and winter die off to the healthy herd we have today. Restoration of the American marten and restoration of Canada geese. Additionally, the department has shown its commitment to fair inclusive governance under this successful system at every opportunity. Changing the board structure is not the right way to further advance our shared goals. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Herrick. Uh, again, for people who are just arriving or tuning in, um, these are very short in initial statements from people. We will be taking ample testimony in the future as well as having a public hearing. Uh, with that, I'd like to move on and um, invite Walter Medvig to um, speak. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Bray and members of the committee. Um, I, I hope to bring in two streams of thought uh, into my commentary. Um, one, I've been involved in environmental matters throughout my career, I'm now retired, um, but I've kept pace with what is happening in the wildlife institution in this country. Uh, where is the profession at today? Where is the association, for instance, that represents state fish and wildlife agencies? And so again, I hope that my comments can represent not only my own, uh, but, but also I think where the wildlife institution is. Um, and so with that, um, my testimony. And again, I'm, I'm Walter Medwid, I'm a private citizen, I live in Derby. Um, the call to make Vermont's Fish and Wildlife Board advisory is not new. In 1965, in a period where there was a great effort to professionalize various boards and commissions running state operations, the Commission to Study State Government had recommended that the Fish and Game Board, as it was called at the time, be advisory only, but the politics of the time killed the idea. That call may have been a lonely one at the time, but fast forward to today, and that call for change has been amplified a hundred times. The board has tremendous regulatory and public policy powers. They, not the department, make the decisions to extend or establish a trapping season on bobcat or other wildlife or increase or decrease bag limits. And, and most importantly, any series of decisions they make establishes public policy without the legislature or without a full representation of the public at the table. That remarkable power over public assets is little understood and little recognized. And it's my belief that S-129 addresses that issue. Leaders in the wildlife profession, including a past president of the Wildlife Society and winner of its highest award, the Aldo Leopold Award, has called for institutional reform, and, I, and that's in quotes, including the incorporation of multiple and diverse audiences. The organization that represents the interests of state fish and wildlife departments, including Vermont, is the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies based in Washington. It is called for departments to quote, transform their structures, operations, and cultures to meet the changing needs of their customers, end quote. In the respective Vermonter polls, 
uh, results have shown substantive disconnects with current wildlife policy and the citizenry. And we also know from an internal survey done through the American Wildlife Values uh, Survey that a majority of staff at the department feel management is not doing enough to address change. What more do we need to establish that we cannot continue in the present mode of operation? S-129 can address four issues. Vermont's wildlife is a public asset, yet public policies impacting this asset are made by an insular group of 14 people chosen to represent hunting, trapping, and fishing interest, which represent only a narrow segment of Vermont's public. Number two, the board in its current state is unaccountable, largely uncredentialed, unelected, and unrepresentative of the citizenry, citizenry and the wildlife and ecological values they hold. Three, there can be no democracy in wildlife management with the current paradigm. There must be more diversity, inclusion, and training. Number four, the legislature should not be the forum for most wildlife issues. A functional board and a more accountable department should be the venue to resolve most issues. And I'll speak to the November, December, 2021 issue of the Wildlife Professional. It's the chief publication serving the fish and wildlife profession from the Wildlife Society. And it was devoted to the subject of, exclusively devoted to the subject of, and I quote, crisis of change. How should wildlifers respond to shifting public values? End quote. The, so the society's director of wildlife policy opened the issue with these comments. This issue's cover feature highlights the, uh, highlights the observed shift in the attitudes people have towards wildlife and wildlife management in North America. This shift, while neither good nor bad, is apparent and consequential for how we as wildlife professionals should and will be able to advance conservation. The public trust doctrine, a foundational element of wildlife conservation success in North America, dictates that the entire public owns the wildlife and it is managed in trust for government agencies for that benefit. These agents, agencies operate as an extension of the public's will and must adapt to its needs if they want to remain relevant and successful." End quote. S-129 is the embodiment of adapting to change that the wildlife profession and the public ask you to make. I've been a student of Vermont's wildlife governance for a decade and a half, and it has been most discouraging. I've also had the great fortune to play the smallest of roles in Hinton, Alberta, Canada in 1995 to assist in bringing back wolves to Yellowstone, a grand, bold restoration of an ecological system missing a key character for over half a century due to our lack of understanding of natural systems and our ill-informed decision to choose winners and losers in nature. Bringing wolves back to Yellowstone was, a, was right it respected science and it respected who we are as stewards of the land and wildlife. It reflected the voice of Americans and it was courageous. And today, millions upon millions of people celebrate the bold thinking that righted wrongs. We have an opportunity with S-129 to be bold, to push wildlife's governance into the 21st century, to free us from the traps of the past and to the list, let the voice of all Vermonters count not just some Vermonters. I urge you to pass 129. It's time. Uh, thank you, Mr. Medvid. And now we're gonna go to Mr. Cully. Hello. Um, Good morning. Good morning, Senator Bray, how are you? Good, thank you. Uh, for the record, Mike Covey, Executive Director of Vermont Traditions Coalition. Um, there are a few things I would add. Some things have been touched on, and I understand this is preliminary and we'll have other opportunities to speak, so I'm going to try to breeze through this. Um, you know, to be blunt, we all understand that a goal of this bill seems to be the disruption and reduction of hunting in Vermont. Um, it's both unnecessary and, in my opinion, injurious to wildlife management in Vermont. 
the concept that somehow respecting the tools of hunting and trapping as the wildlife management tools they are and allowing us to continue utilizing those tools is injurious to the public good is patently false. Um, this is not a zero sum game. There are always excess animals on the, on the landscape. Nature produces an excess in preparation for the, you know, the winter months and the animals that were taken, those surplus animals, uh, we're reducing suffering to be blunt uh, by, by reducing those animal populations and keeping them within the habitat carrying capacity to the best of our ability, which we can't do perfectly. We still have, we still have starvation, we still have disease, but we can mitigate that through hunting and trapping. Um, Mr. Covey, I'm sorry, please. pardon me. Just, I don't want to interrupt, but um, I just want to make sure since you came in when we were already started, so we're going through each of the bills individually. And so we're on one S129 right now, and actually you're scheduled to speak on the other two as well. So okay. I understand that I'm speaking on S129. Okay, uh, great. We're, we're talking about, you know, what we perceive the, the goal of this bill to be, which is to, to reduce hunting and trapping opportunities. Um, is it because it's not addressing any real um, concerns. You know, we have a board that is geographically diverse already. There is, as the commissioner stated, there is representation from each county. Um, I, I'd like to touch upon, you know, a couple of things that Mr. Medwood said. Uh, you know, he, he mentioned Bobcat and he mentioned that the board has this unilateral ability. Well, uh, in 2016, 2017, there was a bill to extend the Bobcat trapping season uh, through the month of December as it had been previously. And there was an acknowledgement from the department that they felt the population of Bobcats was sufficient to support that. However, in an abundance of caution, they urged the Fish and Wildlife Board, despite that, to give them more time for study to, uh, to determine if that was in fact the case. And the Fish and Wildlife Board denied that petition based upon the recommendation of the department, even in light of the fact that the department felt as though there was likely a population that would support it. But in an abundance of caution, the science prevailed and the season was not extended at that time. Um, I, I'd also like to note that there is ample opportunity for public input, um, and, and there are several meetings generally scheduled, especially when something is contentious. That particular petition on trapping took 23 months to go through the process. I think there were something like six public hearings. I think it went to LCAR three different times, and, and you know, LCAR is where the legislature already has oversight on these issues. Um, so, the process works. The process is, is established. Um, I do like what the commissioner said. I hadn't thought of it about the fact that, that the, the six year tenures provide stability. Um, and I think that's very accurate. Um, you know, Mr. Medwood himself noted that the legislature should not get into the business of managing wildlife. Um, we have biological professionals who inform a board that is created of, you know, in New Hampshire, they actually require that one have a license in order to get on the board, uh, which I don't think is a bad thing to be quite frank, because if you don't understand the dynamic conditions that can occur in the field, it's very difficult to regulate a topic that you're not familiar with, that you don't, that you're not intimate with. Um, so in short, you know, the current board structure is very functional. It's very open. It's very transparent. It has legislative oversight and we see no reason to, uh, modify that unless the goal is simply to create a situation where you've added folks to that board who are fundamentally opposed to hunting and are going to find mechanisms or seek mechanisms to reduce hunting opportunities in the state of Vermont and reduce the viability of those important wildlife management tools. Okay. Uh, thank you. Actually, we're running uh, uh, two minutes, three minutes ahead. Uh, Senator Campion, you have a question. Yes, I'm not sure if this is for Mr. Covey or Mr. Herrick. I'm looking for the, um, the description of the role of the Fish and Wildlife Board online. I'm wondering if somebody would just summarize this, uh, what the, the board itself is responsible for. I will defer to Commissioner Herrick. I, I can do that, but <clears throat> I it's more his place. One, two, three. Commissioner, the, the role of the board, reminder. So, the board, uh, the role is uh, the development of rules and regulations 
around hunting, fishing, and trapping and angling. It is a narrow uh, scope. And um, so they develop those after the legislature, of course, is the overall um, um, authority in terms of what is legal and what's not. But under the, underneath that umbrella are the development of the rules and regulations as they apply. So legislature says hunting deer is a legal activity. The, the, they'll develop the rules and regulations. They will utilize, they will consult with people way smarter than me here at the department, um, uh, the scientists and so forth. And there's also public hearings, especially deer hunting has a, um, a number of public hearings when we, like we're already starting, I think in March, as we propose the seasons coming up. Um, but uh, I would mention, by the way, just we have more public hearings than any other state agency. Um, but did I answer your question, Senator? Yeah, that, I just wanted to just uh, kind of return to that. Um, you know, I, listen, I was the one I, who put the, the book, the, the bill forward. I, I really, I have to say, I feel as though um, getting citizen voices to respond, as Mr. Covey, Covey said, to science, to uh, to people who are you know working in the field, to environmentalists, as well as to members of the of the hunting, fishing, trapping um, world as well, is is the way to go. I mean, this this we're not asking for scientists to be on the board, right? We're we're asking for citizens to respond to. Uh, to what's being brought forward and also not only responding to the science, but also to the culture and in things that may, may be changing in our world. I understand, I understand that. that. I'm oh. sorry, I'm not sure. Mr. Kelly, could you please wait? Thank you. Yes. Mr. Harrick. I'm not sure who's supposed to speak now. Yeah. No, so I was just, I was just, I was actually just, uh, you know, kind of just, talking a little bit more about, you know, the goal and the objective, uh, bringing new voices to this table. Um, I, you know, I know that we're going to get into a trapping bill later, which I think most of us feel as though it's, it's certainly the time uh, society has advanced to, to, to cancel out this kind of, of uh, to stop this kind of tr mistreatment of animals. I think most of us have seen the images, the statistics, uh, and it seems to me to, to have people, a range of people on the board, some of whom are, are uh, you know, again, experiencing these, this kind of work in the field, participating in these kinds of uh, different hunting, trapping, fishing practices, but also uh, people that are hiking our trails, enjoying our wildlife, uh, being outdoors um, and simply in, enjoying our beautiful natural environment. So I'll leave it there, Mr. Chair. Okay, so thank you. And actually, so uh, let's pivot. You mentioned uh, another bill and I'm just mindful of the clock. We're doing brief you know, introductions to these. Uh, so we're going to move to S201, an act relating to the use of lake hold traps. And Commissioner Herrick, you are up first. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for the opportunity. Um, I think it's important um, that when we look at these issues, there certainly is an eye towards uh, the culture, as you say. Um, and but the decisions need to be made with an eye, a bigger eye towards science. Uh, that's not to say that the cultural ports are ignored. And speaking of culture, let me read this as it relates to trapping. And this is from Jesse Lawyer, who is 34 and a Missisquoi Abnaki. The trapping of the uh, fur-bearing animals is not only a part of Abnaki culture, for the use of furs, but is an integral part of our food system that we're continuing to rebuild after centuries of colonization. To ban all trapping in the state of Vermont would further hinder our reconnection to the land and an important part of our culture and food systems. 
he would love to speak um, and I'm going to make sure uh, that he knows when that invitation uh, is available for him. But as I mentioned, culture is a piece of this discussion. Um, and to say that it's not would be um, not completely honest. However, from the science standpoint, um, I think we need to make sure that we have the facts, that we don't have um, um, emotions guiding the argument, um, and that we don't allow disinformation to become considered factual. And to that end, I'm actually going to turn over the whatever time I have left to Kim Royer, our fur bearer specialist here at the department. If I may, Mr. Chair, just jump in with just one quick question or comment. Sure. The commissioner continues to talk about the science. Great. But you're not asking that scientists be on the board. You're asking the board to respond to scientists. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. So that being said, again, I, I don't think the board is looking at the makeup of the board. It, it doesn't look like a, a bunch of scientists. It, it looks like a uh, looks like again people largely that would be responding to it. And I don't know how the shift in the membership would alter people responding to the science. You make my point for me, I think, Senator, in that um, if the implication is if we put different people on it, they're going to interpret the science differently, um, then I'm then that's a problem because I don't think then, well, I mean, no, I'm saying people, you're just, you're asking people to respond to science, correct. diversifying the board, you're still going to ask the same, you know, just a different group of people, you know, a few different kinds of people to respond to that science. It seems like this is a threat in some way, but again, it's not scientists that we're putting on the board. We're asking scientists to weigh in with the committee. Correct. So I guess I'm questioning what's the problem we're trying to solve if we're still gonna ultimately, one, we're taking away the authority of the board in this bill and giving it to the commissioner um, who I do listen to the scientists, but I also can tell you, I get feedback from every aspect of community in Vermont, not just hunters, uh, folks that uh, are on all sides of this issue. Um, and so I'm wondering why we are looking to um, take away the authority from the board and why we, what's the problem with the board that exists now that we're trying to fix? That's what I'm trying to understand, Senator. And correct me if I'm wrong, and I'd like others to weigh in on this as well. We, you know, it's interesting. We ask governors all the time and people to run on issues that they can, can make change around. One of the things that used to not happen, if you look at the State Board of Education, for years, the State Board of Education was responsible for appointing who ran the education program. So the governor for years, could, governors historically could say, hey, I'm not gonna get involved, we're gonna leave it to the State Board. We're going to actually, and this in a way is a similar process in making it, I'd say, more democratic. I mean, somebody can actually say, hey, you know, I don't, I, I'm not going to weigh in on this. We'll let the Fish and Wildlife Board deal with it. But this is actually giving more say, more control to, to the administration um, and saying, hey, if, if people really want change, they can elect somebody who is going to put either support certain practices or stop certain practices. So if I can interrupt yes, for a moment. Um, so thank you, Senator Campion for these good questions and you know observations and but my concern is that we have three bills to do this brief introduction to and that if we go back to um, the board makeup and governance issue that we won't get to hear from Ms. Royer for instance and fair enough thank you uh, so thank you and, I, and I'm going to turn it over to her I swear <laughs> Senator Campion um, I welcome the opportunity to sit down and chat with you in this. These are the kind of conversations I really relish. So thank you for the questions. So with that, I will turn it over to, to Kim. Thank you very much. Uh, nice to see everybody today. 
my name is Kim Royer and um, I'm a wildlife biologist with the Department of Fish and Wildlife. I have been for 40 plus years and I consider myself a wildlife advocate both for the species that I manage and for the habitats that they depend on. And I've been committed to the department's mission, the conservation of fish, wildlife, plants, and their habitats for all the people of Vermont for the 40 years that I've worked for, for the state. And um, I won't say that this is easy managing wildlife for all the people of Vermont, because as, as I think Senator Bray, you even suggested at the beginning, this is a pretty contentious topic and people have very disparate opinions about how wildlife should be managed. Uh, but in this case, from a science perspective, um, we, use, we use traps and trapping systems for a whole variety of different things that benefit wildlife. And one of the most important things is that these, these systems can be used to protect endangered, threatened and endangered species. We actually use them to protect spiny softshell turtle up on Lake Champlain, a threatened species to minimize risks from animals such as foxes and raccoons who predate on them. They're used across the country in that way. We've used them for scientific research purposes, the same traps that avocational trappers use we have used to study foxes and coyotes where we trap the animal, just like a, a trapper does. And in fact, we've actually contracted with trappers to help us collar the animal and follow it for two to four months after that and find no evidence of an impact from the trap. Uh, we've, we've recently, more recently um, used foothold traps and cage traps to study bobcats with the same results. Um, the animal gets caught by the foot. We call these foothold traps because they're designed to catch the animal by the foot. And, um, and then we collar the animal and follow it around with no evidence of, of harm to that animal. Um, the thing that's really interesting about trapping systems is that some states where they have actually banned traps like Massachusetts, uh, they've actually found that um, the population of beaver in particular uh, doubled in about four years. And the sad part or the paradoxical part about it is that, um, that they're actually today trapping as many animals with the banned trap as they were prior to the trap ban in 1996. And unfortunately, because of all the nuisance complaints that the legislature received after banning trapping, they gave authority to municipalities to actually um, give out permits to use the band trap and or destroy the beaver wetland by removing the dam. And um, upwards of 50% of beaver taken in Massachusetts now are taken as a nuisance animal. So well-meaning people trying to ban an activity that they didn't know a whole lot about and actually had the opposite effect of, of what they were hoping. So this is a very complex, nuanced, controversial issue, hard to talk about in sound bites, hard to talk about in five minutes, uh, but there are cultural benefits as well. We, our trappers can be our eyes and ears on the ground. We had done a Martin recovery using trappers from Maine and New York, reintroduced them into the Southern Greens, thought it had failed, and it was trappers who actually took photos of the animal when they were out fisher trapping, sent them to us and started a a study that we did with Central Connecticut State University. Trappers tell us where animals are crossing the road so we can protect key crossings. Uh, we, we collect data from trappers. We collect data from the animals that are turned into us. We're doing genetics work on fox and coyotes. We're testing for Echinococcus multiloccularis, a, a zoonotic tapeworm. We're uh, collecting rabies information. We're collecting rodenticide information, all on animals that have been trapped that we wouldn't be able to do if we didn't have access to those, to those uh, specimens. So yes, this is a controversial topic. Uh, it's very polarizing. I will say um, to Mr. Medwood's comments that the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies 
would no way suggest that we should be leaving people who have been traditional partners behind. We have to bring them along with us and expand the tent. That's what fish and wildlife agencies in the 21st century are trying to do is bring in all different voices to speak to us on these issues. And that's why we have these public meetings that we have when we change any kind of regulation through the board. So thank you very much. And I'm happy to answer any questions at some point in the future. Okay, great. Thank you. We're going to keep ourselves moving right along because we have an ambitious schedule. Um, I invite now uh, Ms. Larson, Peggy Larson, to speak with the committee. I see your tile here. Good morning, Mrs. Good morning, Ms. Larson. Thank you for joining us. Yes, good morning, Christopher Bray, and thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm going to start out by saying I'm a veterinarian. My master's degree is in pathology. I'm also a lawyer. So my background is science. Veterinary medicine and pathology is science. And based on this science, I'm gonna give you some facts. First of all, animals are sentient. They can feel, they can feel pain, they can feel fear. They're no different than we are. And I didn't realize this back when I was a trapper and I also did some hunting. But when I got into vet school, I was working for a neurosurgeon over in the medical school. And he used to take me to the brain cutting sessions, the brain autopsies on humans. And as he was showing me these different brains with the different problems that they had, he described the structure and the function. And he pointed out that the prefrontal cortex and the hypothalamus were areas where pain was sensed. Well, meanwhile, over in the veterinary school, I, in anatomy class, I was studying animal brains. Well, guess what? They have a prefrontal cortex. They also have a hypothalamus and a thalamus. They have the same structures as our brain. They are sentient. They feel fear and pain. Um, it was very uh, awakening. That's when I sort of changed, well, more than changed my mind that uh, animals were like us. They needed to be protected. Um, I've treated animals caught in traps. Uh, I don't know, over the course of time in North Dakota where I used to be a large animal veterinarian and also here and have seen the intense damage done to these animals, broken bones, many of them I amputated legs on. That poor little cat from Heinsberg, I couldn't save her. The trapper hadn't uh, bothered to check his traps so she must have been in it for probably four or five days. She was grossly dehydrated. Uh, my friend Rick Long, who was a, a classmate of mine in law school, found a great white owl in a trap in, uh, in his property in Bristol. So trapping really, if an animal dies in a trap, they, they are, is caught in a trap, they suffer intense pain. Um, so that's fact number one. This is based on science. This is a fact, okay? Fact number two, is that the trapped animal is not always the target animal. I have read that as much as one out of 18 animals is the target animal. So I've always chosen to use one out of three as being the target animal. Uh, therefore, we're killing animals that should never have been caught in traps. And some of these could be endangered species and have been over the, uh, you know, over the course of time. Um, Another, another thing that uh, is, is disturbing to those of us who care about animals is the way that the trappers kill these animals once they find them in traps. Uh, according to their pictures that they post on Facebook uh, with their dead coyotes hanging from trees and also packed in the back of pickup trucks and the pictures they show of the animal caught in the trap with the bleeding paws and so forth. But what they use is what they call a whacking stick. They don't wanna waste the bullets on them, so they beat them to death. They hit them over the head with a whacking stick. Or what they do is step on their chest or step on their trachea to stop them from breathing. Uh, this is not a fun way to die. It's not a fun way to die. So here are my reasons, I think, for, for banning the leg hold trap. <clears throat> Only one in three out of the animals is a target animal. Um, if the non-target animals are released, who knows what happens to them? They may be crippled up, they may die, and some may survive, but we don't know. Um, the target animal is in, inhumanely killed with a whacking stick, or he's stomped to death, choked. Um, some of the trappers don't check their traps daily. 
as, a, as we've all know about that, because uh, those of us in the profession have, have seen this. We've seen animals that have been in traps for a long time. We, we can tell this by the extent of their injuries. And then number four is sometimes these traps are set close to hiking trails. Granted, traps still are still being able to set on public land, but public land also has hiking trails. Uh, people walk their dogs there. One of my friends in Williston uh, was walking his dog on some public land here in Williston and found a, uh, a fox in a trap. And so uh, these are the reasons I think the traps uh, I feel the traps ought to be banned, and therefore these are facts and they're based on science. And if you have any questions, please ask me, and thank you again for inviting me to speak. Thank you, Ms. Larson. Uh, and now I'd like to invite Mr. Uh, Covey to speak on 201, please. Thank you, Senator. Um, so as you may guess, we're fundamentally opposed to this bill. Um, there's a lot of misinformation out there about trapping. There are a lot of presumptions being made. Uh, frankly, the most disturbing presumption being made um, when, when we hear this parsed as cruelty, inherent cruelty, um, you know, words like sadist and such are often thrown around to, to presume your neighbors, your community members who trap to be inherently sadistic individuals simply based on the fact that they engage in this is a fundamentally flawed approach to legislation. Um, we hear it all too often, trappers are singled out, uh, doxxed, attacked. Um, none of that conversation takes into consideration all the work that has been done to bring trapping into the 21st century. You know, there have been uh, 30, 30 years worth of studies, 42 million plus dollars worth of expense in testing traps and uh, determining how to make them the most humane possible. Um, I could go on with a two hour soliloquy about the ways we can target for specific animals and avoid catch of other animals. Um, I think that the, the uh, 18 to one is a wildly uh, um, exaggerated figure. I've only seen figures like that in anti-trapping publications. Um, you know, we're hearing you know, Trappers Club and Stomp and Crush and every trapper I know carries a 22. Um, I, I should clarify, I am a trapper. I, I don't trap much because I don't have much time for it, um, which leads to another point. Um, you know, if, if somebody's not checking their traps on a daily basis as prescribed by law, we want them caught. That's not a trapper, that's a poacher. If someone's breaking fish and wildlife laws. We shouldn't be lumping them in with people that are uh, complying with those fish and wildlife laws, uh, which incidentally are supported by trappers. Um, final point I'd like to make, uh, because I know I need to keep this brief and we'll have more opportunity to discuss it. We, we often hear statements about the public trust and, and they're accurate. You know, uh, wildlife is held in the public trust and that public includes hunters, trappers and anglers. And, you know, this is not a zero sum game where somehow the rest of the public loses when I, when an outdoor person takes an animal. That's inaccurate. It's a misrepresentation of the reality of the situation. Um, we, need to, we need to acknowledge and, and recognize that. Um, the final point I would make on this quickly, um, traps are designed to capture the animal without harm. You know, the pad of an animal's foot is a pretty incredible mechanism. Uh, that's why they are foothold, not leg hold traps. Uh, the pad of an animal's foot is has a strong leathery bottom. It's exceptionally well padded with uh, uh, gristle. Um, they're, they're, they're a crucial part of that animal's ability to exist. Every death in nature, almost every death in nature, is a painful death. Whether it is a, an animal getting eaten from the hind end forward by coyotes, um, you know, whether it is a bird taken out of the air by a hawk, that animal's going to experience a painful death. Uh, starvation, disease, still a painful death. Um, the, the concept, the point, the goal with trapping, as with all outdoor pursuits that take a, take a life, is to do it as painlessly and effectively as possible. Um, are there occasionally issues that arise? Are there occasionally problems, like a shot gone wrong? Um, on, you know, on an animal, yes, absolutely. There are dynamic field conditions that can sometimes create 
a negative outcome, but the goal for everybody is to have the best uh, and, and most humane um, outcome for that animal's death that is possible. You know, there's no getting around the fact that we are, we are taking animals' lives. Um, that's, that's part of nature. And humans are not apart from nature. We are also a part of nature. And I'm glad to talk more on this topic when you're ready for further testimony. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Covey. And I would uh, just on logistics, if anyone who's no, not speaking, uh, if, could, if you could mute your mic, that would be helpful because sometimes we're picking up stray noise. Um, the other thing that Mr. Covey just said reminded me of something that I meant to say at the outset, and it's something we'll have to remind ourselves of as a group as we work on these bills. And that is, uh, I would encourage all of us to uh, stick to talking about the bills and the programs and the policies and not get into characterizing anyone, who, the individuals on either side. Um, and I'm not saying that we're doing that has happened here, but it's a useful reminder because um, it keeps the personalities out of it and lets us focus on what we're doing in terms of policy, program, science outcomes, et cetera. So uh, with that, I'd like to go to Mr. Aberth. Good morning, sir. How are you? Good morning. Uh, thank you for allowing me to testify. Um, my name is John Aberth. I'm a retired college professor. And for the past 10 years, I've uh, been a licensed wildlife rehabilitator here in Roxbury, Vermont. I do both birds and mammals. So I have a license from the Vermont Department of Fish and Wildlife, and from the U.S. Department of Fish and Wildlife. Uh, I just wanted to briefly echo Peggy's testimony that um, trapping, uh, as uh, evidenced by wildlife veterinarians uh, looking at thousands of cases in the field, trapping uh, lake hole traps do cause uh, numerous injuries in animals, including fractures, amputation of digits, laceration, bleeding, and so forth. But even if there is no visible injuries, it has been proven that trapping uh, can, by simply constricting the blood flow of the limb, releases toxins into the animal's system that eventually will kill it. So even if you're releasing an art, a non-target animal, for example, the animal will die from the trap because of these unseen toxins. So you, you can't simply um, you know, uh, do a visual in terms of assessing the animal's injuries from trapping. Um, one of my main, uh, using my academic research uh, interest, uh, I've researched the justifications for trapping in Vermont. Do we really want lake hole trapping to be part of a relationship between humans and wildlife? One of the main things I looked at was the idea that trapping is an effective wildlife management tool that it's, uh, you know, can manage populations and nuisance, so-called nuisance animals. Conclusion that I came to is that it is not. In fact, trapping is counterproductive to good wildlife management. And there are a number of reasons for that. The main one, however, is that lake hole trapping by necessity is indiscriminate. As Peggy mentioned, uh, non-target animals are caught in traps um, you know, you often hear there's two non-target animals for every one, at least uh, trappers themselves say that. Um, so lake hole traps can't even target a single species of animal, let alone members within that species. So as a hunter has told me, you can't pull a trigger in a trap. You can't pull a trigger in a trap. So, uh, you know, the, the Department of Fish and Wildlife, for example, has um, you know, used hunting to manage a deer herd, for example, by placing uh, limits on the number of points uh, in a buck in order to uh, increase the maturity of, of deer in the herd. You can't do that in trapping. You simply can't because you know, it's too indiscriminate. And in terms of population control, uh, trapping is actually counterproductive because it just as often uh, traps mature individuals uh, as well as, uh, as opposed to young ones. And therefore, uh, young individuals to take the place of these mature individuals will have larger litters for a longer period of time and therefore, uh, you know, amplify 
populations. This is the graph, uh, you know, I usually have a PowerPoint, but you probably can't see this very well. But this is a graph produced by the Massachusetts Fish and Wildlife Department that purported to show that after the trapping ban went into effect in Massachusetts in 1996, he had a 50% increase uh, in population as Kim Royer mentioned. The problem is, the problem is the evidentiary basis for this graph is completely faulty. And there's a simple reason for that. Massachusetts, like Vermont, used trapping harvests to track populations of fur bearer animals in the state. However, in 1996, that trapping ban went into effect. So in other words, uh, you went from 1,136 beavers trapped in 1995 to 98 beavers trapped after the trapping ban went, to, went into effect. So the whole basis for that assumption, it was completely uh, eviscerated. So how did they, uh, you know, how did they come to the conclusion? Well, if you ban traps, you'll have a, you know, explosion in population. I asked that question of Dave Waddles, who was the fur bearer biologist in Massachusetts, went right to the horse's mouth, so to speak. He said to me, quote, harvest was greatly reduced after 1996. A valid question is how did that affect the population estimate in these following years? Did low harvest numbers inflate the estimate lower or doesn't that matter? I am not familiar, I'm not, I am not familiar enough with the inner workings of the model to even speculate. So in other words, you know, it's simply a guess, you know, the model was no longer valid. And um, the other point I would make is that trapping is the least sustainable solution to nuisance wildlife conflicts. And uh, there was another study done in Massachusetts by Beaver Solutions, uh, a study of 400 of over or nearly 500 conflict sites. And it found that trapping was successful in only 16% of, of the cases. Uh, and that simple reason for that is once you trap the animal, then a new beaver colony moves in to that site. Uh, by contrast, humane solutions, such as beaver deceivers, um, were successful 97% of the time because they were designed to be long-term uh, cost-effective solutions instead of a temporary one. So um, if you look at public attitudes towards trapping, there's strong public support for what Kim Royer mentioned, uh, trapping for ecological or damage control reasons or for, for research, but you can always build that exception into a trapping ban. What we're talking about here is recreational trapping. And in terms of recreational trapping, there is very low support for trapping done for money recreation or for fur clothing. Uh, a survey was done by the, you know, the Rural Studies Institute at the University of Vermont in 2017 and found that 75% of Vermonters want to ban trapping. So I would just conclude by, by noting that a lake hole trapping ban, which I you know, strongly, strongly support, would be a useful wildlife management tool benefiting humans and animals for two reasons. Number one, it would, it would encourage the utilization of humane long-term cost-effective solutions to nuisance wildlife conflicts. Number two, it would remove the harmful, unpredictable impacts of trapping upon wildlife populations because trapping is simply too in indiscriminate to be a useful tool. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Abers. Um, with that, we are gonna, and thank you everyone for uh, sticking so well to the time limits and moving us along, I realize it's a small window, but um, it's a, a useful one for an introduction. Um, and so with that, we're going to move to S-281, an act related Mr. to- Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Chairman may I? Very yes. I just want to, as the chief sponsor of the bill, I want to thank the witnesses. All of them, including the witnesses in opposition, because a, first, a bill is introduced as a first draft, and uh, they have, the opponents have- told us some things we ought to look at to make sure we're doing it right, if we do it. But I also want to thank the supporters very much for your support, because I, I think this is ultimately a, uh, an ethical question as much as a, as a, 
as a scientific question, but thank you for the science, because it is very common that people will demean a legitimate logical argument by saying, well, you're just being emotional. So thank you for the science. Okay. Uh, thank you, Senator McCormick. And with that, we'll move forward to S-281, an act relating to hunting coyotes with dogs. Our first uh, uh, guest is uh, Jeffrey Mack. Mr. Mack, I don't know if you can hear us. Uh, so far, we're just seeing your tile and name on the screen. So we saw your microphone go on and off, but not your video. I mean, you could actually, if you're having video problems, we could just listen to your testimony. Uh, so Mr. Mack, I don't know if you are having, it sounds like you're, it seems like you're having technical difficulties. Uh, maybe they'd be resolved by uh, leaving the meeting and logging back in. So we'll just switch up the batting order while you get the electronics sorted out. And we'll go to Commissioner Herrick. And if you're back when he's done, we'll, you'll just jump right in there, swap places. So let's go to Commissioner Herrick and we'll come back to Mr. Mack. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'll be very brief. Um, the department would propose that instead of an outright ban that we the issue be taken up by the Fish and Wildlife Board with the goal to create rules. These rules uh, would require permits uh, for this uh, current use of dogs as we do for bears, limit the number of hounds, limit the use of hounds to a specific season, um, and consider having a permit um, for this activity. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mack, are you set back up? Apparently not. Um, Jude, maybe you can assist him in some way. It might be useful for him to leave the meeting and reconnect. That sometimes that's a cure. Um, uh, I'm trying, but I, I, I've okay. done everything I, yeah. Okay, I I'm sure. Um, so let's go on then to uh, Ms. Hansen, Diana Hansen. Thank you, Senator you Bray. Good morning, thanks for joining us. Good morning, thank you everyone. My name is Diana Hansen and I'm a resident of Craftsbury, Vermont. And I'm grateful for this opportunity to speak on behalf of Bill S-281. First, I would like to take a quick moment and clear up any misconceptions that I may be in any kind of disagreement with the ethical hunting traditions in Vermont. I grew up in a family with ethical deer and moose hunters from Vermont, New Hampshire, and Massachusetts. The practice of ethical hunting was shared with me throughout my childhood with an emphasis on respecting animals in the wild, such as moose, bear, deer, and coyote and how to appropriately shoot an animal to lessen and omit pain or suffering. So I feel confident in my standing when I say that the ethical and honorable hunt is an ancestral right. And I have plenty of experience with Vermonters in the current hunting community who share the same value. I'm here today to share an incident that happened on my property in late February, 2019 where a pack of coyote hounds entered the rear of my property and caused approximately $500 in property damage. These hounds chased a lone coyote onto the property early on a Saturday morning and my 10 year old son alerted me to the site that was difficult to process at first. The dogs were running in such a chaotic frenzy, zigzagging all over the backyard, so much so that I did not see the coyote at first. My husband and I told our two children to remain inside the house no matter what, as we grabbed our boots and jackets and headed outside. A little while later, a number of pickup trucks pulled up in front of the house and four hound hunters walked onto our property. The hounders did not act on our immediate request to stop and remove the dogs from our property as well as leave the premises. 
the dogs continued to run chaotically and were pushing the coyote down into the snow while biting and mauling the coyote. In what I assume was an attempt to escape, the coyote ran up on top of our greenhouse with the hound dogs following which in turn left large gashes in our double, double layered greenhouse plastic on the roof, as well as the front and rear doorways. At this point, I was able to get a closer look at the coyote and I was disturbed at how injured the animal was. Its tail was broken and hanging loose. It was covered in blood and clearly exhausted. Meanwhile, my children witnessed all of this through the dining room windows. And it was not until the dogs ran off the property on their own following the coyote that they were removed from the area and the hounders began to retreat. When my husband approached the, the hound hunter who owned the dogs and asked him to help cover the cost of the damage, his response was, and I quote, it's the state's coyote and the state should pay for it. In the days after, I followed the dog prints in the snow around the backyard and there was blood all over the snow and everywhere the coyote and the dogs had been. Our game warden never came. Our select ward would not help us. A state trooper kindly showed up and filed a report, but because our land was not posted, he couldn't help us either. Both of my children and I in the year following suffered physical and emotional trauma from this incident that required psychotherapy and support for PTSD symptoms high anxiety, lack of sleep, and general feeling very unsafe in our home and even walking down our road. To this day, we continue to hear hounds hunting throughout the year in our neighborhood between the hours of 10 p.m. and 3 a.m., as well as early weekend mornings very commonly. I'm here to speak today, not just because of the damage and danger coyote hounding presents to all landowners and, and the public in general, but also because it's affecting our ethical hunting community dramatically. Since my incident alone, there has been approximately 800 acres posted in my local community, and that number keeps rising as incidents continue to occur. Coyote hounding breaks down the long-standing moral code deer hunters have with landowners in ways where healthy land management can be achieved collectively by a complete lack of respect to landowners and how they wish to manage their property. Unlike other forms of hounding, coyote hounds are violent, chaotic, and cannot be called off the hunt as I witnessed myself. As a mother and community member, Vermonter, business owner who fosters space for education on wellness and complementary medicinals to my community, I feel coyote hounding in its open season 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, poses a threat to our forests, our fields, our communities, our homes, our mental health, and those who practice open recreation in at least Vermont's Northeast Kingdom. And I just wanna quickly note that I attended the Fish and Wildlife meeting on closing the open season on coyote hounding that same year, later in the year. And that room was absolutely packed with a very wide array of Vermonters farmers, hunters, non-hunters, teachers, that all had um, valid reasons to start regulating this and closing the open season for safety and public reasons. And unfortunately, those calls, including um, statements around science, were not heard. So um, thank you for uh, allowing me to be here and hearing my testimony today. Thank you very much. Um, and I don't see Mr. Mac ha having re returned yet. So um, pause for a moment. Okay. Um, Mr. Covey, I'm we're changing up the order a little bit. Um, would you like to... Uh, Please speak to um, S-281, thank you. I certainly can. My testimony will be relatively brief on this as I'm still learning about it. Uh, it's not something I've ever uh, experienced. Um, Hello? One, one thing I would like to say is that it seems rather misplaced to uh, penalize deer hunters. Um, sorry, Mr. Covey, could you pause for a moment? We're getting some feedback. So Mr. Mack, we see you've logged back in. And um, 
We're hearing from Mr. Covey right now, and you'll be up next. Thank you. Okay, please proceed, Mr. Covey. Thanks. Um, I, I find the word ethical is often thrown around, and it's often used in a pejorative manner. In, in other words, if you don't agree with me, you're unethical. Uh, it's a subjective term, and I'm not sure it has a place in legislation. Um, just because my concept of what ethical hunting may be is probably quite different than some of the other folks on this call. Um, and I think that could be said for everybody. Um, you know, we all have a different perception of what's, what's acceptable and what's reasonable. Um, I would like to clarify that the coyote uh, hearing in question was not a, a closure of hounding season. It was a closure of coyote season in general. Um, that was not, not too soundly supported. Uh, and I'd like to just delve quickly into some of the misstatements of science around coyotes since they're the centralized topic of this. Uh, we often hear about uh, uh, compensatory reproduction and, and all parties agree that the current uh, management regimes being allowed for coyotes are not harming the population. We're all in agreement on that. You've heard it stated today. Um, that being the case, you know, we don't have a biological imperative to change how we're doing things. And we, we don't need to change things in the absence of a biological imperative. Connecticut did that. They, had ex they experienced uh, enhanced problems due to closing the coyote season. I believe it was the months of March through June, perhaps, or March through May. Uh, I can clarify that by getting that documentation for you. But their coyote problems increased greatly. Um, one of the places where I do know that hounds can provide a service that we, we can't get otherwise is if there's a coyote that is a problem. Uh, hounds have a unique ability to find that specific animal which we, you know, we clearly do not have as humans. Um, a hound can take that scent and can find the animal that's in question. I don't want to get into this a whole lot because as I said, I'm still learning about it. But um, in my opinion, this is legitimate. We hear concerns about property damage, which are absolutely legitimate. Um, there's a bill in the house that I think is, is a really viable approach to dealing with this because it doesn't single out a form of hunting uh, it speaks to the problem that can occur from anybody's dog. You know, it's a H250 and it is a strict liability for all dog owners, uh, which we would support and like to see actually. Uh, I'm aware of three incidents involving hounds in the last five years, including Miss Hansen's, where there was damage. Um, the Vermont Veterinary Medical Association has a paper out that, that um, expresses that in the last five years, approximately 500 children have been treated for dog bites that required medical attention. That doesn't include adults that were bitten. That doesn't include property damage, livestock damage. Uh, I, I think it's a far more appropriate approach to dealing with any issues that may arise uh, to deal with them on that broad scale, that broad landscape of, of saying, okay, uh, everybody's dog can pose a problem. Not everybody's dog does pose a problem. What we should deal with is the dog posing the problem rather than a blanket ban against a certain segment of, of society that we've decided we're going to discard. We don't, we don't care about their interests or their concerns. Um, and I, I would leave it at that for now. I'm happy to speak more on this. I'll definitely be digging more into this uh, to increase my own knowledge base over the coming weeks. Um, so well, thank you. Uh, just a, a couple notes. To, uh, on 281, there it doesn't refer at all to ethics. Uh, it's not an ethical decision. It's a it's a straight straight language on uh, defining methods of rated hunting, and just uh, doesn't allow the use of dogs for the uh, taking of coyote. Um, and uh, just for anyone listening who might also think we're talking about a season, that's not part of that bill either. Um, and you're reminding me to remind folks that if you go to the legislative website at the homepage, you can always put in any of these bill numbers. So S129, um, S201, S281, uh, type it into the search box and you can get pull up the bill that we have. Um, as we work on bills too, you can follow intermediate drafts by going to the committee webpage and look under the bills in our committee. Um, if, if with I that, have, Senator, um, um, I'd like to move on to Mr. Mack if we can, thank you. Um, so Mr. Mack, I know you've had some connection challenges. Uh, are you able to hear us and speak to us? You hear me? You hear me? Yes, sir. Great, thank you. 
Um, it's a little hard to hear you. If you could maybe speak up or something. Thank you. The floor. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. And the uh, floor is yours. Um, um, thank you for having me. I want to make sure everybody knows that I'm a native. Um, Mr. Mack, are you on both phone and computer? Because we see your square twice, and sometimes when that happens, we get an echo and it's much less clear. So, all right, now you're down to one square. That's progress. And can you hear us? And can you say something back to us? Here's the answer is no. <clears throat> All right, so uh, Mr. Mack, we have a few more minutes and uh, I'm sorry that you've had the technical difficulties. It happens uh, with some regularity, unfortunately. Uh, if you drop the video link you have open now and just call in by phone, we may be able to hear you. Uh, better. Um, but if you're unable to do that this morning, as I was saying to everyone here, we'll be coming back to all these and we'll reschedule time with you to provide fuller testimony. Um, with that, I, I just want to turn to the committee. And so we now have a, an extra few minutes, uh, unless Mr. Mack is able to rejoin. Um, are there any committee questions? Uh, so here's the phone connection. Mr. Mack? Yes, I'm here. Great. And now can we can actually hear you. Yes, perfect, loud and clear. So uh, let's proceed. The floor is yours. We're inviting you to talk to us about S-281, the um, coyote, uh, hunting coyote with dogs, Bill. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. As I said before, I'm a native Vermonter. I was a deer hunter in my earlier years. I owned a deer camp. I connect with wildlife uh, many, many times, enjoyed my time in the woods. My wife has been a native Vermonter her whole entire life. She's been a dairy farmer. She's also connected with animals and wildlife. And where we live now in Shoreham, we are directly impacted in a very negative way about hounding for coyotes. It is on a regular basis here. They start bait piles a mile up the hill from my house. In October, they range from uh, pigs that are being slaughtered to remains from deer hunting to ducks to partridge to uh, pheasants, and then we go to fish in the spring. So after they feed them whatever they can, they draw them in. They come with a lot of pickup trucks and a lot of long guns, and they will border my 10 acres on a regular basis. It is very, very disturbing, not only to watch the slaughter of coyotes, but to hear the sounds of the coyotes being slaughtered is just as horrible as the visual. And this goes on for months, from December, January, February, March, and into April. Uh, no relief, the coyotes are traumatized as well as uh, my household, my two dogs being Labrador retrievers and high strung. So when all the commotion starts, the best thing for me to do is to close my drapes and to turn the music up as loud as I can until everybody goes away. So that directly impacts me in a negative way and my wife and my two dogs, and you can't even go walking up the road in any given weekend because you would absolutely put yourself and your pets in grave danger. Um, it's, it's the end result for what they're after is to kill as many coyotes as they possibly can for absolutely no other reason than to make the kill. And that's, my life through the winter months. It's absolutely horrific. It's horrible. It's made us discuss about leaving this part of 
United States, just go somewhere where they actually appreciate wildlife. I have been here 17 years and I live where there's a lot of coyotes and I've seen two coyotes in 17 years in Shoreham. I've been here 50. So they say that they want to keep coyotes uh, fearful of people, but why they feed them for four or five months out of the year to draw them in closer is would be the exact opposite effect of how I feel. And the bait piles are literally 30 feet off the main road. So that's my experience with hounders. Is there any questions I would love to answer? Okay. Um, well, let me see if there's any questions from members of the committee. Um, for now, so uh, thank you for rejoining us and um, sharing your particular story. We'll be taking more testimony in the future. This was an introduction day, and I'm just looking to see if there's any more, uh, if there are any questions from Mr. Mack or uh, if there are any other comments from the committee. Senator Campion. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator Bray. Uh, I know many of us have probably been receiving emails about a possible hearing tonight. Uh, and some people still believe that is happening. So I just wanted to give the chair uh, the floor to uh, let people know when the public hearing is happening. Thanks uh, for that, uh, Senator Campion, that reminder. So again, we are scheduling a hearing from a week from tomorrow. So that's Thursday, February 10th. 5.30 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. Um, right now, Legislative Council is preparing the, an announcement and all the sort of formal notice required, you know, uh, to make it formally noticed, there'll be a link posted that will allow you to sign up in advance. We'll ask people when they sign up to, um, you know, provide their name, uh, where they're from, and then also just to indicate whether they're there to speak for the bills or against the bills. And that's so that um, as we call names during the hearing, we'll be able to alternate between the two sides over the years we've found as a legislature, that's a good practice for um, keeping things running kind of on an even keel to alternate that way. And so uh, we'll, uh, we'll be doing that again a week from tomorrow. Wednesday evening, uh, sorry, Thursday evening, the 10th of February. Um, one what of the is the time again for that? 5.30 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. It will be entirely virtual. So there'll be a Zoom link put out and people will be called up uh, in order. Um, the other thing is the time will be when we have, I'm guessing that there'll be a lot of signups. So probably the speaking time will be limited uh, to something like one or two minutes. Again, it's a short amount of time, but when you're in a meeting like that, you can cover a lot of territory uh, and in just a brief moment. And it also provides, uh, maximizes the number of people who can participate. So with that, um, I just wanna thank everyone for a very uh, polite, helpful, civil introduction to it. I know it's an emotional topic and uh, it can be divisive, but um, you know, my experience with Vermonters is that when they sit down together and talk about something in a healthy uh, framework, sort of a good environment that I hope will continue to create in this committee room and in the hearing that we will uh, respectfully hear from each other come together, uh, learn some things, and then make some decisions about um, which bills move and in what ways, uh, et cetera. So with that, if there are no last committee remarks or questions, we are Senator McDonald. I don't know if that's a, okay. Um, 